I do actually uh, I do actually see Moira on right now, but uh, just for those of you who are wondering why I'm speaking right now, um, uh, Moira has asked me just to facilitate rounds today because she's um, off site and uh, may not have consistent connection. So I'm just gonna wait another minute for people to join in. Um, I'll sort of make my usual sort of request, which is if you can have your cameras on and uh, it's not gonna screw up your bandwidth too much, it'd be great to have, uh, have, uh, have your cameras on so we can sort of see one another. I know it sort of helps with the engagement and sense of uh, connection. Um, and uh, we'll just, I see a couple more people joining and then we will uh, we'll get started. Um, just to let you know that we are recording uh, today's session, uh, just so you know that, and uh, actually that the recording of the session uh, will actually get posted on the rounds table as well um, as a rounds table episode. Uh, so a bit of a, a shout out to that, uh, that platform. If you're not already registered, it's a great uh, way to learn about the newest evidence and you can listen to this and other sessions on that, uh, on that platform. So um, I think we've got a bit of a quorum now, so I, I, we, we should just get started. And as people join, um, you know, you'll be able to catch, uh, catch up. Um, I'm thrilled to be able to introduce our two speakers today, uh, Kieran Quinn and Amol Verma. Uh, many of you will know uh, the two of them, but just as, by way of introduction, Kieran is a clinician scientist and general internist who works at Sinai Health. And Amol is a clinician scientist and general internist who works at uh, Unity St. Mike's. And uh, today uh, they are bringing uh, you a COVID-free uh, version of the top five papers. Um, the way that we're gonna structure the presentation is they're gonna present all five papers at once. As you're hearing about the papers, you may have questions that you'd like to bring forward or just wanna discuss uh, thoughts around the evidence. Uh, and please feel free to use the chat and communicate that way. Uh, and what I will be doing is sort of uh, curating the chat to identify questions that we'll bring forward to the two of them uh, in the last 15 to 20 minutes where we've left some time for discussion. Okay, so without further ado, I'm gonna pass things over now to Kieran and Amol. Thank you, Brian, for the warm welcome and thank you, Tina, for helping facilitate today. Uh, welcome everybody to a, I'm gonna hit record here on my phone, sorry, from the rounds table. Uh, audio editor asked me to do so. Welcome everybody to a special episode of the Rounds Table. Uh, we're joining you live from the University of Toronto General Internal Medicine Citywide Rounds. And today, uh, Dr. Amol Verma, who you know uh, very well on the Rounds Table from past episodes, uh, we're going to present to you a fully vaccinated COVID free episode discussing the top five papers for general internists over the past year to year and a half. Uh, Amol, welcome back to the show. Yeah, thanks, Karen. We're calling this the uh, recovered former hosts, recovering former hosts edition. Um, and so thanks to all of our fantastic colleagues from across the city for joining. I also, just as a caveat, get extremely nervous when uh, a lecture is called the top five papers. I much prefer calling it kind of like five papers we thought were kind of cool, um, as opposed to some objective normative ranking of, uh, you know, what is ultimately an unquantifiable value of research question. Absolutely. So on that note, uh, I will, uh, I will. Uh, just review the, the objectives. As Amol said, the top five was just a ruse to get you to show up today, but really we're going to review five interesting and what we thought were important papers about the, over the last year. Um, we're not going to talk about COVID. We're going to talk about things that you may not have been able to keep up with because COVID has been occupying all of our collective intention for the last 18 months. Um, I have no personal disclosures to make. Uh, Amol is a part-time employee of Ontario Health. Uh, and so that's- uh, Rest assured, none of my comments today speak on behalf of our governmental health agency, which I'm sure no one was confused about. So how did Amol and I go about selecting these supposedly top five papers of the year? Well, uh, occasionally him and I read a few journals. Uh, we asked a few friends, phoned a few friends that we know that are up to date on these types of things. Uh, of course, we listened to the Freilich Brothers' rounds table. So Mike Freilich, for most of you, knows as clinician scientist at Sinai. He's taken over the rounds table with his brother John, and they're doing an outstanding job keeping it going and growing the listenership. Um, but bottom line, it's been a completely arbitrary selection process, and we hope that you agree with our selections. would love to hear if you have other selections that you thought didn't make this list but should have. 
So without further ado, we'll go down the top five papers that Amol and I have selected for today's rounds. The first, which is fresh off the press, is the Emperor Preserve trial. That looks at the involvement or use of SGLT2 inhibitors in patients with heart failure. And in this case, it's preserved ejection fraction. So spoiler alert, a big win for SGLT2 inhibitors there. We're gonna look at the ever uh, uh, increasing quest to shorten antibiotic duration in folks with uh, community acquired pneumonia. Uh, third, we'll take you through the EAST AFNET4 trial looking at rhythm control in patients with atrial fibrillation. So revisiting an old question with new interest. Next, for those of you who practice critical care or have interests in oxygen targets, uh, we're going to look at the ICU ROCS trial. And finally, a homegrown trial, um, uh, really important in the New England this year, looking at START AKI around the timing of initiation of dialysis. Um, again, for really relevant to those of you who practice on the critical care side of things, uh, maybe in their locums or on community practice. So Amol, I'm gonna jump into things here. Uh, first, I'll lead off with the Emperor Preserve trial. This just came out uh, just under a month ago, um, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, and you know, I, I am just constantly blown away by the ever evolving evidence around the use of these uh, therapies in folks with diabetes and now in cardiovascular disease. And sometimes it seems to me like it's too good to be true, but nonetheless, uh, let's take you through the Emperor Preserve trial. So Karen, tell us what's the bottom line from this trial? What's your key highlight takeaway? Well, this, this was a multi-center randomized trial in all. It enrolled symptomatic patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So not the typical heart failure with reduced ejection fraction trial. And in this, we found that empagliflozin, one of the key SGLT2 inhibitors, reduced the overall risk of cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization. And that was compared to placebo or usual care. The number needed to treat for this was 30. All right, so walk us through, what's the, what is the overview? Describe the study in some more detail for us. Right, so as mentioned, it's a randomized trial. It was done at several centers around the world and uh, a pretty typical you know, traditional RCT that most of us would be familiar with. It enrolled just under 6,000 patients. Average age was 71 years old, 45% uh, female and predominantly Caucasian population. Uh, folks had symptomatic heart failure, the predominantly NYHA2 class, so sort of some limitation uh, related to their heart failure, but not uh, severe limitation. I, I think, you know, you would see a typical spread of uh, cardiovascular disease. Half the patients did have atrial fibrillation, which I think is something just to think about. Um, for those of you uh, who may not be up to date on the classification of heart failure, Preserved ejection fraction is greater than 40% by ECHO uh, or other uh, standardized testing. Um, and two thirds had an EF with greater than 50%. There's been a new classification around mildly reduced between 40 and 50%. Uh, and then they also had to have a probian, NT probian T level greater than 300, or if they had atrial fibrillation greater than 900 picograms per mil. These were patients who were what were called stable uh, on their diuretic dosing, meaning that they hadn't had their diuretics changed in at least a week. Um, and they followed these folks for about two, just over two years. A comparison group was a standard placebo controlled uh, therapy. And of course, uh, you know, your usual sort of guideline directed therapy for heart failure. And so what were their major study outcomes? What did they find? So from a primary outcome standpoint, they were looking at a composite of both death from cardiovascular causes or hospitalization for heart failure. Uh, this was done in a time to event uh, analysis framework. Uh, and then some of the key secondary outcomes just to point out. So there's a you know, literature around these uh, therapies as being renal protective. Um, so they looked at the rate of decline in, uh, in the glomerular filtration rate. They also you know, tried to measure uh, some patient reported outcomes. So they looked at quality of life using the Kansas City cardiomyopathy questionnaire. Um, and then of course, safety outcomes, which are primarily of interest uh, in medicine, of course, do no harm. And we've seen mycotic genital infections with SGLT2 inhibitors previously, uh, hypotension, acute kidney injury as the main ones that were reported here. <laughs> 
what did they find? Well, this is the main figure one with your time to event uh, analysis shown. On the y-axis here, you look at the cumulative incidence of that primary outcome. Uh, and on the x-axis is time. The inset is just a, a um, truncated y-axis to make the results look more impressive. Uh, and what you see is, you know, immediate separation of the benefit favoring empagliflozin in a reduction of cardiovascular death and hospitalization for heart failure with a hazard ratio of 0.79 and the confidence intervals uh, demonstrated there. So clear benefit uh, immediately that sort of levels off after, you know, sort of three to six months uh, where the lines become parallel and you don't see much further benefit beyond. And so what about those secondary outcomes that we're obviously all of us get nervous around, you know, safety or, or you know, and maybe also any, any impact on, uh, on quality of life? Yeah, great, great points. Um, so if you break apart the primary outcome, which was pre-specified in their trial, predominantly that primary outcome is being driven by a reduction in hospitalization for heart failure. So just about a 3% uh, absolute risk reduction with the hazard ratios listed there corresponding to a number needed to treat of 31. Uh, there was um, a reduction in death from cardiovascular causes, just under a percent in absolute reduction with uh, the hazard ratios and confidence intervals crossing one. Um, the, the sort of subgroup analyses, when they looked at that heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction, so that 40 to 50% folks, which is about a third of them in the trial, those actually appeared to have the greatest benefit uh, in those primary outcomes over the, the individuals who had, you know, ejection fractions greater than 50%. Um, and then as they've done in previous uh, trials, they, they looked at whether these patients had diabetes or not. And the, uh, the primary findings seem to hold up regardless of uh, someone's diabetes status. Um, the, you know, trial wasn't designed to uh, or powered to measure differences in quality of life, but they didn't see any uh, in this case uh, for this trial either. And in terms of the safety outcomes that I mentioned, which were lumped into a composite, you know, there's quite a high rate of adverse events, but no difference between the groups. Um, so about half the patients experienced some of those uh, adverse events mentioned, uh, but no, no apparent differences between them uh, in a statistically or clinically significant way. So, you know, what does this build on as far as uh, the literature we know about? Well, there's several trials, you know, the CHARM trial, TopCat, Paragon, that have looked at different therapies in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Uh, none of those showed any benefits from their primary outcomes. Uh, we have seen cardiovascular benefits in SGLT2 inhibitor trials in the Emperor with diabetes, in the Emperor, which was reduced uh, ejection fraction, as well as the DAPA, uh, dapagliflozin trial. Um, so this, this is really a uh, progress in a patient population with preserved uh, ejection fraction where most um, uh, interventions have failed previously. Um, just a little bit of think about, you know, a quarter of the patients discontinued treatment or, or left the trial and didn't wish to participate anymore. That was balanced on both sides, but it didn't appear to be related to adverse effects of the drug, but uh, quite a high dropout rate. Um, and as always, anything industry sponsored, you know, just to keep in mind uh, that these trials are, are funded by the drug companies. For me, I wonder what's actually driving this. Um, they published a follow-up letter in the New England Journal that showed that the, the renal protective benefits are still present, probably not as, as large in magnitude as the uh, uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction but they still don't believe that it's likely driven by a reduction in hospitalization for, you know, acute kidney injury or other related renal mechanisms. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know. And, and those of you out there who are higher, more expert, have more expertise in this, please feel free to chime in at the end. Uh, and then of course, there's always the question is this is a class effect or this is just an empagliflozin specific effect. Uh, and, and hopefully there'll be some trials to, to reproduce these results in the future. Yeah, so Karen, this is kind of a, you know, breakthrough in one sense, which is that until now we've been, there's been a huge amount of therapeutic pessimism around the hef uh, you know, condition, which is we've till now really not seen any effective therapies. Um, and at the same time, really a dramatic immediate benefit that I don't, like part of me makes me wonder how much of this may or may not be sort of too good to be true. 
how much of it may be related to the diuretic effect in those people who are pretty close to having half ref. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious to like, how do you contextualize this? Um, and uh, you know, what's our takeaway? My instinct is kind of to wait for some more uh, other trials and maybe focus more on like that 50% and above group before really declaring this yeah. a huge win for the half group. Yeah, I think it's a great point. I think uh, everything should be taken with a grain of salt, uh, although not in heart failure. But uh, these are this is a new breakthrough, as you said. It's something that's succeeded where others have failed before. Um, I think that there's enough evidence for me in the heart failure population in general to suggest that these are probably a real result. But before I really enroll this in my practice as sort of standard uh, therapy, I'd like to see it reproduced in some in some other trials and, and hopefully with some other agents that are uh, in the SGLT2 class uh, inhibitors. Nevertheless, I think that the trial was very well done um, and I didn't see any major, major problems with it such that uh, myself and others you know, around the world in, in discussing it have said that these, these therapies should be considered if, if your patient is symptomatic, you're trying to use diuretics or they're stable and you're not helping um, and they're interested in, in reducing these uh, you know, cardiovascular death and hospitalization outcomes. Um, I think uh, that it's, it's something to think about and, and you might be able to try with your patients are interested on that level of, of practice. Um, just uh, one other thing to point out, in Canada, presently, these therapies are not currently approved by Health Canada for the treatment of heart failure. Um, so that's just also something to keep in mind when you're making these decisions with your patients. Great, thanks, Karen. Let's change. Uh, let's change categories. Uh, we're let's talk about beta lactams. Um, this was a trial that caught my attention, uh, published in the Lancet earlier this year. Uh, and as you kind of alluded to in our introduction, the never ending quest for ever shorter courses of antibiotics in syndromes of uh, infectious syndromes. So this one is uh, whether we could discontinue beta-lactam treatment after three days for patients hospitalized with community acquired pneumonia to non-critical care settings. Um, all right, I'm also take us through what you think that the bottom line is for this trial. Yeah, so the high level takeaway here is that in this multi-center placebo controlled randomized control trial of patients hospitalized with community acquired pneumonia on medical wards, but not critically ill, who were clinically stable at uh, three days, uh, according to some pre-specified criteria based on vital signs and, and things like that. Uh, it was non-inferior to stop their antibiotics after three days rather than continuing them for eight days. Okay, well, it sounds like there's a little bit to unpack there with a couple of things you highlighted, but I'm always interested in less is more. So let's see if we can cut down from, from five or seven days to even shorter. So tell me, Amol, how did they go about addressing this question? Uh, yeah, so, so the, um, uh, this was a randomized control trial. It was a multi-center, double-blind, placebo-controlled, and uh, not designed as a non-inferiority study, you know, comparing the longer duration of antibiotics to the shorter duration of antibiotics. Um, there uh, were 310 patients in the study. They were uh, typically 73 years old, about 40% were women. Importantly, when we think about the severity of pneumonia that was included in this study, the, the typical PSI score was 80, which actually equates to kind of low-ish risk according to the categorization of PSI. So about a one to 3% predicted mortality. So they were sick enough to be hospitalized, but they were on the, the sort of less severe end of the spectrum to begin okay. with at, at enrollment. Important, important caveat. Um, and their comparison group? Yeah, so they compared uh, uh, amoxiclav versus placebo for five days. This is, people were uh, randomized at three days. So they received some beta-lactam treatment uh, at the beginning. So whether that was a third generation cephalosporin or you know, a, a clavulin, uh, sort of clavulinic acid inhibitor uh, combination there. So the, the beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitor. Um, uh, so uh, that was the first three days of therapy. And then at day three, they were either randomized to continue with oral amoxicillin clavulinic acid for five days or placebo. And tell us about some of the you know, inclusion criteria for these patients. Yeah, so really uh, important here to know who we could apply this trial to. So they were hospitalized with CAP. They received the beta-lactam monotherapy. So that's according to the European guidelines. So they did not necessarily receive um, 
the uh, uh, you know azithromycin or other uh, uh, macrolide combination uh, as we might uh, do sometimes in, in our practice here. The patients all had to be clinically stable after three days, which was defined as meeting all of the following criteria. They were afebrile, they had a heart rate less than 100, they had a respiratory rate less than 24, they had oxygen saturation greater than 90% or higher, they had a systolic blood pressure measurement of 90 or higher, and they had a normal mental status. So that was kind of, you know, a, a fairly simple way to assess clinical stability. They excluded patients who had severe or complicated pneumonia. So if you had a big effusion, um, if you were immunosuppressed, if it was a healthcare associated pneumonia, if it was aspiration related, um, or if it was like an atypical organism such as Legionella, those were excluded. And I think that those, that stability criteria, you know, it's something I'm sort of going through in my head, regardless when we're talking about our patients and figuring out whether, you know, they're ready to go home or we're continuing therapy. So it seems reasonable. Yeah, it's one, I agree with you. It's one of the things that I find the most appealing about this study is those are really a practical set of criteria that I think most clinicians would probably be able to arrive at just based on a gestalt, right? Like even if you don't remember yeah. the specific numbers there. All right, I'm ready. Tell us what they found. Yeah, I mean, the bottom line there is that they found no difference. Uh, so the, their primary outcome was cure at 15 days after the start of their, the first day of receiving antibiotic therapy. They predefined uh, a, a non-inferiority margin of 10%. Um, and what they found was that cure in the placebo group, 77% were cured at 15 days and 68% um, were cured in the uh, continuing antibiotic group. And the definition of cure at 15 days was, um, you know, uh, essentially uh, cl remained clinically well, did not require resumption of antibiotic therapy, were, were not rehospitalized. And then what about some secondary outcomes there? Yeah, so uh, they, they then sort of extended out to 30 days to see who is the cure. And again, the cure was essentially the same. 72% were cured in both groups. It's kind of... Um, funny to think about how the cure rates actually went down in the placebo group between 15 days and 30 days. And I think it's really just the definition of, you know, did you get sick again? Were you rehospitalized, right? So a proportion of people get rehospitalized between 15 and 30 days. So, um, but essentially no difference uh, in 30 day cure. And then, you know, the numbers of 30 day mortality are very small. It was not power to detect it. But there was no difference. So 2% so mortality in the placebo group, 1% in the antibiotic group. That difference is really just three deaths versus, versus two deaths. Um, and uh, uh, hospital length of stay um, was uh, not significantly different between the groups, sort of five days in the placebo group versus six days in the antibiotic group. And so just to um, uh, reflect on, on the overall findings here, uh, you know, they, they essentially call it a non-inferior uh, a finding between the two groups, uh, acknowledging that they pre-specified a 10% margin. And I think you could potentially quibble with a 10% difference. Um, so how do we contextualize all this? Mm -hmm. the, um, you know, the, the IDSA guidelines, the American Thoracic Society and the Infectious Disease Society of America currently recommend about five days of antibiotics. That was based on the a, a previous, previous recent trial comparing five days versus 10 days of antibiotics for community acquired pneumonia. This study suggests actually three days is reasonable in people who have non-severe, uncomplicated community acquired pneumonia and an excellent early clinical response. And what about some of the counterbalancing measures here? Yeah, I think the critiques of this study, obviously it's small. There was you know, only 300 patients enrolled. I think the point there is it was statistically powered to detect a 10% non-inferiority margin, right? And so, you know, um, that's the, the, um, uh, that's the sample size that they, that they reached uh, and, and, and pre-specified. And so I think, you know, if you believe the 10% non-inferiority margin, and then you find that the results fit within that margin, then yeah, the, this study demonstrated non-inferiority. Um, uh, the one thing is the authors did estimate a 90% cure, and they really found sort of 70, 70 to 75% cure rates, right? So, so people were not cured as uh, much as they expected um, so I think uh, in both some, groups. Yeah, I think there's some nuances to this uh, trial in making some practice recommendations. And, 
you know, before we get into that and sort of the takeaway, what, what are your thoughts about these unanswered questions and sort of some generalized? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple unanswered questions. One is there is a, a bit of a difference in the way that they practice there, which with sort of beta-lactam monotherapy, as opposed to, I think, a lot of people in North America add a second agent to beta-lactams um, for, for our hospitalized patients. There's a lot of practice variation around that, for sure. Um, so, you know, there's an open question, but beyond that, I think the... Uh, you know, patient population uh, and the, uh, the general approach here is pretty consistent with our uh, community acquired pneumonia population. The other big caveat is these were people with pretty mild pneumonia uh, based right. on their initial severity presentation. So what do you think, Amol? Is this something that's going to change your practice? What's the take home for folks on the line today? Yeah, for, for me, the takeaway is I'm a bit too chicken to change my clinical practice based on one 300 person randomized control trial until some distinguished body of experts tells me I should. So I'm probably a little, you know, and also because I think that the benefits for less antibiotics accrue when a whole health system or population uses them. It's not so much an individual patient benefit, right? So the five versus three days, like if I'm out there swimming alone, uh, uh, prescribing people three days of antibiotics, uh, it's probably not what I'm looking for. So I'm, eager to see how these get incorporated into new guidelines, but I'm not going to really change my uh, personal practice. All right. Well, I think that's an important trial to highlight for folks to make their decisions around that. Um, so let's move on to the third of our five papers today, uh, a George Gershwin song who's got rhythm and who needs anything more than rhythm. So this was the East APNET4 trial looking at an early rhythm control therapy in patients with atrial fibrillation. Okay, Karen. So uh, give us the give us the highlight here. What's the Cole's what's notes? The bottom line? So this is another multi-center international randomized trial. Um, key things to think about: patients with atrial fibrillation. They had atrial fibrillation as a new onset condition with within a year of enrollment. Um, they had comorbid cardiovascular conditions, and what this trial really showed was that if you pursue rhythm control early on in these folks, uh, using either pharmacotherapy or interventional ablation. Uh, this reduced the risk of a composite of various cardiovascular outcomes, including cardiovascular mortality, stroke, heart failure, or hospitalization for acute coronary syndromes, compared to the standard usual care uh, under the guidelines uh, within the regions. Um, impressively, this was a number needed to treat at eight of 18 uh, over a time course of five years, uh, just given how the follow-up was, was constructed here. Great. So uh, let's dive in. Tell us a little bit more about Yeah. This so study. again, just mentioned international trial. Um, they, the intervention itself was open label. Uh, the outcome assessment was blinded. Uh, now they had just under 3,000 uh, participants enrolled. Uh, average age was 70 years old. Just under half were female. Again, a fairly uh, typical spread of cardiovascular comorbidities. You know, most people had hypertension and a smattering of stroke, heart failure, and, and uh, chronic kidney disease. Um, uh, people had early atrial fibrillation. Uh, on average, it was 36 days, so just over a month from their diagnosis that they were enrolled in the trial. And they were followed for just over five, one, five years uh, on average. The comparator group was um, uh, rhythm control using, uh, sorry, that was the intervention control. Uh, intervention group was rhythm control using antiarrhythmic drugs or ablation plus cardioversion uh, in the cases of persistent atrial fibrillation. The comparator group was usual care. Uh, and this was, um, it, it could include symptom directed rhythm control. So sometimes people might use uh, antiarrhythmics uh, for symptoms alone on top of rate control therapy. Um, everybody was to, to practice uh, a guideline directed rate control and of course stroke prophylaxis uh, according to the, the risk scores and patient decisions around that. All right, so what did they find here? Yeah, so they were gonna measure two primary outcomes. Um, uh, the first primary outcome was a time to event composite of those cardiovascular uh, outcomes I mentioned at the beginning there. Um, and the second was the number of nights they spent in hospital per year, uh, which they found no difference for, by the way. Um, but we will get to the time to event composite in a second. Um, here is your figure for that primary composite outcome of cardiovascular uh, outcomes. Again, on the uh, y-axis, accumulative incidence of those outcomes, on the x-axis, uh, years since randomization, since uh, on average people were followed for five years. Uh, 
And again, what you're seeing here is, uh, you know, within the first six months, the separation of those curves favoring an early rhythm control strategy uh, with, you know, possibly some accrued benefits over time, but about after two years, you'd say that not much more benefit is being accrued. There's your hazard ratio of 0.79 and your confidence intervals on top there. Um, Great. So that's a pretty impressive effect on the primary outcome, Kieran. Uh, take us through the secondary outcomes. Yeah, yeah. You know, these, these are these are everyone loves a positive trial, so these are often uh, we're favored towards that sometimes by by their impressiveness. Um, secondary outcomes. So they they did measure some quality of life. You know, patient oriented outcomes around uh, quality of life using the EQ five D scale. No difference there. Uh, safety outcomes uh, around adverse events related to procedures or, or the drugs that were used for rhythm control, about a 15, 16% adverse outcome rate, but balanced between the two arms. Um, uh, although there was specifically some higher adverse events related to uh, the rhythm control medications in the early group versus the usual care. So um, in some of those sub subgroup analyses, you might see some differences. Um, overall though, I think, you know, if we're putting this in the context of the larger literature around atrial fibrillation and therapies. Um, you know, if you remember the AFFIRM trial, there was actually suggestions in there in a trend, although not deemed to be clinically or statistically significant uh, towards increased mortality with a rhythm control strategy thought to be related to the toxicity of some of those medications. Um, and some of the thoughts were that maybe there's differences in whether the folks have early or later onset. Uh, and this trial includes ablation, whereas the firm did not. Um, of course, it's not a blinded trial, um, although they tried to, to you know, minimize bias with outcome by blinding outcome assessment. Um, and they didn't compare the efficacy of the different treatments within a rhythm control strategy. So we don't know, you know, if you believe that primary finding, we don't know is, is, it, is it better to use pharmacotherapy? Is it better to go straight to, uh, to ablation? Is there some combination of both? Um, there was a, a companion trial called the STOP atrial fibrillation that did show uh, benefit of ablation over pharmacotherapy. So if you're trying to combine those two, then you might be able to think that you would prefer to pursue um, uh, ablation over pharmacotherapy in early AF. Uh, but these are sort of, you know, compiling all the grander uh, literature together. Um, and then, you know, there's some unanswered questions. So if you, if you achieve rhythm control um, in some of these patients, can you then, should you then stop their anticoagulation? What's their long-term risk of cardioembolic stroke in, those, in this kind of a setting? Um, can you take off some of their other medications uh, if you achieve early rhythm control? And, and there, you know, this wasn't designed to answer those questions. So hopefully uh, in the future, we'll get some, some more studies looking at that. Wasn't one of the big differences between this trial and the previous trials, though, Karen, just to that point of anticoagulation, the, the um, continuation of anticoagulation therapy in the rhythm control group? Like, so if anything, you know, it's, it's probably way too early to say that you would. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think there's, there's a growing body of evidence that I've seen that shows, you know, if you've had atrial fibrillation once, you're always at risk for it, including cardioembolic stroke, which just depends on whether we catch it at a certain time or not. So I think there's, you know, it's, we're always worried to withdraw anticoagulation, but they do, there's a big bleeding risk that goes along with that. And that's a potential for harm. So if we can take that away uh, and safely support our patients, you know, then it's a win-win. But I don't, in my mind, we don't have the evidence enough yet to, to make that decision. And hopefully that comes. So yeah, I, that makes sense. And so Kieran, with this trial and the STOP AF and kind of the body of evidence that emerged around early rhythm control therapy, um, it does feel like a bit of a practice shift um, around this. So how has this, if at all, changed your practice? Yeah, I think so as the general internist, you know, I'm not often managing these individuals on a longitudinal basis, but I might be the one who picks it up during a hospitalization, you know, either incidentally or they come into us for that particular reason. And so it's changed my practice to ask the experts uh, earlier on now and say, okay, instead of, you know, counseling you on various um, therapies and what your life might look like moving forward with this new diagnosis, I'm going to send you to our cardiologists and get an opinion from them about whether you should have early, you know, and they're the ones doing the ablation and managing these drugs. So that's what's changed for me is just asking earlier and more often.
Yeah, me too. And I'd be curious to hear from our cardiology colleagues whether they've seen a huge bump in consults for AFib and how manageable that's been on their end. Because for sure, it's changed my practice to do that. Yeah. All right, let's keep moving here at a good clip. Uh, I'm only wanting to introduce the next trial. Yeah, so the next trial is all around the uh, controversy surrounding the use of supplemental oxygen in hospitalized patients and specifically uh, uh, in patients, critically ill patients or ICU patients. So this is the ICU ROCKS trial, although we will uh, also touch on the other uh, very interestingly named HOT ICU trial and the LOCO2 trial. So ICU trials have the catchiest names, I think. They do, absolutely. All right, so take us through the bottom line for this and why we chose it. So in this multicenter randomized trial of mechanically ventilated ICU patients, uh, conservative use of oxygen therapy did not show benefit with respect to the number of ventilator free days compared to a usual standard oxygen therapy. Okay, and you know, even though some of us here are, are general internists on the wards, I think many of us practice where we're covering ICUs or potentially looking after ICU patients if we're locuming outside of urban centers. So I think it's something it's, and often we're looking after these patients following ICU. So I think it's helpful to know this evidence, um, whether it affects your practice directly or not. Uh, so I'm all, Take us through sort of the design of this trial. Yeah, so uh, this was a uh, multi-center, single-blinded randomized control trial. So patients were blinded, but obviously it was not possible to blind the, blind the clinicians to their oxygen target. And the, the outcomes assessment was blinded as well. So they included almost 1,000 patients. Uh, typical age was 58 years old. 37% uh, were women. Uh, they had an Apache 2 score of 23, which equates to about a 40 to 50% mortality risk. Um, and the, the comparison was conservative oxygen targets versus usual oxygen therapy. And the conservative targets was that you wanted to keep oxygen between 90 to 97% oxygen saturation for your intubated patients, as opposed to usual, which is there's no limit. Okay. And, uh, and they had this kind of nice little, uh, and I, I like that uh, was Kieran was preparing these slides, he kind of put the Goldilocks not to uh, just right, not yeah. too high, not too low. Um, and so, uh, you know, they had this little algorithm for if you were in the conservative therapy group, basically, you had the, the nursing or RT staff had to intervene immediately if the patient's oxygen saturation was greater than 97% to reduce the uh, fraction of inspired oxygen to get them down to that target range, as opposed to uh, in the usual group where you kind of just let people ride. All right, so what were the findings of this Goldilocks trial? Yeah, as I kind of, uh, you know, clearly they didn't, they misnamed their trial. Goldilocks <laughs> yeah. even has OX as the last two yeah, totally. letters. Like it could have been perfect. We can um, go into the business of creating critical seriously, care Seriously, I names. think so, they need your help. Um, okay, so uh, as I kind of alluded to already, their primary outcome, uh, they saw no difference. That what they uh, uh, set as their primary outcome was the number of ventilator-free days from randomization to day 28. So these were people initially intubated, um, and they found no difference, 21 versus 22 days. Um, they looked at quality of life and secondary outcomes. They actually did see some differences. So they found that the conservative uh, uh, oxygen group had less severe problems with mobility and personal care. Um, uh, and then uh, death as an important, obviously, uh, secondary outcome, but underpowered to detect. They saw no difference at either 90 or 180 days, and the death rate overall was about 35%. One interesting subgroup, uh, which raises some possible hypotheses for future exploration, is the group that had ischemic hypoxic encephalopathy, so people who had, uh, for example, cardiac arrests leading to ischem ischemic uh, brain injury. Um, that group uh, seemed to do better with the conservative oxygen therapy at 180 days. You had a pretty like striking mortality difference, 43% versus 59%. You know, that, that level of effect size is maybe, you know, probably chance plays into it to some extent, uh, but it at least raises an interesting uh, question there. Yeah, and I think there was some discussion around the mechanisms of oxygen free radicals and sort of hyperoxia in a brain that's damaged by hypoxia. So I think that that's enough to sort of pique people's interest, but I agree it's a, it's a ge hypothesis generating finding, not a, not a definitive one. So yeah, so let's put this in the context um, of, of all the other trials there, uh, Kieran. So, so 
You know, actually, one of the things that that started all of this was a, a large meta-analysis led by our colleagues in Hamilton called the IOTA meta-analysis. So they looked at 25 randomized trials in acutely ill adults. It was really a smorgasbord, sepsis, ICU, stroke, trauma, MI, cardiac arrest, emergency surgery. So a whole bunch of different uh, people, but acutely ill adults. And what they found was that... Um, uh, Patients who received a liberal oxygen targets generally above 96% uh, suffered increased 30-day mortality with a relative risk of about 1.14, uh, so 14% increased relative risk of mortality. In that uh, meta-analysis, there were only about 300 critically ill patients or ICU patients. So since then, there have been several randomized trials published uh, in the ICU population. So there was the one we're ta we talked about just now, ICU rocks. There was also the LOCO2 trial. So that was published contemporaneously with ICU rocks. In that trial, there were 205 ARDS patients who were randomized to a lower uh, PAO2 target uh, as opposed to a higher target. That trial was actually stopped early for harm. There was a signal towards increase uh, in the primary outcome of, of mortality uh, and also uh, mainly driven by a greater incidence of mesoteric ischemia. I think it was a relatively small number of events, like five events, um, but uh, the, the data safety monitoring board for that trial felt that they were unlikely to see a benefit and there was no reason to continue. So that trial was stopped early. The HOT ICU trial, which was just more recently published uh, in this year, um, uh, included, uh, this is even larger, so included 3,000 hypoxemic ICU patients they were randomized to you know, conservative versus more liberal oxygen therapy. And that trial, which was powered to mortality, found no difference in mortality at 90 days. So I think we have now like a pretty large body of ICU evidence uh, uh, pointing towards no benefit towards conservative therapy uh, for oxygen. Um, there are a couple of unanswered questions and then truthfully a little bit of ambiguity in how you might interpret these findings. So first in the unanswered questions, we already raised the point about ischemic hypoxic encephalopathy. Of note, the HOT ICU trial did look at the, they didn't specifically look at ischemic uh, brain injury, but they looked at the cardiac arrest population and they found no difference in that subgroup. So I think it remains an open question about that. The second thing is that these trials collectively still do not exclude the possibility of benefit for a small mortality benefit um, for conservative therapy, uh, uh, up to a five, per, uh, sorry, up to a 1.5% absolute benefit would still fall within kind of the confidence intervals that we saw within these, within these trials. So, you know, having a super large uh, trial to actually look at this might be reasonable given the ubiquity of oxygen use and sort of mm -hmm. potential for population level benefit. Like maybe we do need to be thinking about this, like some of the statin trials or things like right. that, right? So, yeah. so I think um, one thing I'll just comment on in terms of how you might interpret this before we go down a little bit of a tangent, how you might interpret this is there's no mortality benefit to conservative uh, oxygen. So we should, you know, uh, ICU nurse and staff are overworked. So let's just make this one less thing that they need to think about. So just go with standard care. But the other way to think about this is in the setting of if, if we were to run into scarce oxygen supply, for example, during a pandemic, uh, it would be reasonable to give people conservative oxygen uh, therapy. Uh, it's not necessarily been shown with harm, especially in those larger studies. And most likely that small loco study, maybe that was like a, you know, small sample kind of by chance finding. And so, uh, you know, maybe you, you can, can, you can interpret you can, it whatever way fits your, your problem. Whatever you need. Yeah, exactly. So I think <laughs> at least it justifies, you know, if you are in a tr emergency triage scenario where you're needing to ration oxygen, you could right. at least do it with a clean conscience, I think. Okay. So here's a little tangent I want to go down, uh, Kieran which relates to the, the broader dialogue around structural or systemic racism in medicine. So there was this really important article uh, published in the New England Journal about racial bias and pulse oximetry measurement. So they tested in a couple of different samples um, for occult hypoxemia. So basically if your uh, measured oxygen saturation with a bedside pulse oximeter um, correlates to your uh, blood oxygen saturation based on an arterial blood gas. And so what they did was they compared about 7,000 white patients with 1,000 black patients based on self-identification. And what they found was that um, 
uh, the pulse oximeter uh, systematically under identified people who are hypoxic. So in, in black patients as compared to white patients. So wow. um, the, the 11% of black patients who had a normal pulse ox reading actually were hypoxemic on an arterial blood gas, as opposed to, uh, you know, 4%, 3.5% of those in white patients. And it just, I think, points to, you know, who these devices probably were designed on and calibrated for. It raises really important questions as we think about wearable devices and apps and things like atrial fibrillation detection with a Apple Watch and whether that works in people of different skin tones. So I think it's just, and, and highlights to me actually like a really um, interesting and insidious way in which systemic racism could, could yeah. uh, affect our clinical practice in ways we would never even have thought about. Yeah, this really opened my eyes up. Occult hypoxemia and occult systemic racism across the medical profession. So thanks for bringing that to our attention, uh, Amol. Um, let's just wrap this up. So we have some time for questions here. What, what's the takeaway message for the ICU ROCS trial uh, for the folks on the line today? Yeah, I think we've kind of covered it. Basically, conservative oxygen targets do not seem to provide clinical benefit in this critically ill patient population. You know, remains to be seen I think whether you know the the non critically ill population needs more evidence, um, uh, but uh, you know I, I think points to maybe one less thing our ICU colleagues need to worry about. Excellent. All right. Last but not least, tribute to the Rolling Stones. Start me up and a, a trial with the Canadian Critical Care Trials Group here around the timing of starting dialysis in acute kidney injury. So. Just to give you the bottom line for this trial, the START AKI trial, multinational RCT. Uh, again, we're talking about critically ill patients here, and they had severe acute kidney injury. What they found was that if you started uh, dialysis earlier, so within 12 hours of identifying the problem, what they called the accelerated strategy, it did not seem to lower the risk of death at three months or 90 days compared to what we would typically use as targets around biochemical indicators and other clinical indicators to start dialysis in these folks. Validates the thing the nephrologists always say to us, which is dialysis is not going to solve the problem. Unfortunately. Yes, that's right. You know? So, okay, take, take us deeply into the study. All right. So um, open, la uh, open label trial, uh, you can't really, I mean, you could, I suppose, sham somebody on dialysis, but that would be ethically challenging. So open label trial, again, with blinded outcome assessment, just under 3000 patients, uh, average age 65, only about a third were female. Uh, again, you know, from a dialysis and, and hospitalized uh, um, critically ill population, uh, comorbidities abound and hypertension, diabetes, et cetera. Uh, just uh, about under 60% were admitted to the ICU for sepsis and 43% of those folks had septic shock and they were followed on average for 90 days. Um, what they looked at was this accelerated renal replacement therapy intervention. So starting within 12 hours of identification of severe AKI versus a standard strategy uh, using these clinical markers you see down here, you know, things like potassium uh, that's significantly elevated, severe acidemia, uh, very low bicarb, volume overload, the, the typical uh, AEIOU stuff you learn in medical school around uh, some targets to start dialysis. Sounds great. And what did they find? Well, they looked at uh, the primary outcome was was good old fashioned mortality um, of any cause at, at 90 days. And here's your uh, figure looking at that. So on the y axis, we see survival from zero to 100%. Uh, and on the x axis, we see days since randomization over time. Um, and you really see no separation or meaningful differences between either an accelerated strategy or that standard strategy using those clinical markers to start dialysis. Um, some of the secondary outcomes they looked at, there was higher dependence, so a, a prolonged need for ongoing dialysis when that was started earlier, uh, about a 4% absolute risk difference with a relative risk of 1.74. Um, so potentially you know, significantly uh, affecting patients likely in an adverse way. Nobody really wants to be on dialysis unless they have to be. Um, some of the other safety outcomes around the use of dialysis, they had uh, uh, adverse events specifically related to the dialysis itself, um, you know, hypotension shifts in, in um, electrolytes, et cetera. Um, and then you also have sort of the physical infection and other complications related to the dialysis catheter itself. 
Um, and those were different uh, between the uh, uh, favoring the, the standard care, right? So higher risk of harm in the uh, early renal replacement therapy accelerated RRT arm. Um, if you wanted to quantify that as a number needed to harm, that would be 15 people at 90 days. Um, and uh, those are just, again, just the list of some of those uh, adverse events, events that were related to the therapy or the catheter around infection, et cetera. All right, so put, bring it all together. What's your takeaway? Yeah, so just to put it in the context, there's been several different trials, AKI, KI, which is a medical ICU population, Elaine, which was a surgical ICU population, an ideal, really, you know, um, unstable uh, findings. Some of them were po positive, some of them were negative. Uh, and just thinking about the START AKI trial, uh, you know, we don't know what the patients who were not enrolled, who were excluded looked like. So then maybe there's a, a systematic difference there that's important. Um, and this is because one of the criteria was that the physicians, you know, who are treating these patients subjectively felt that one uh, strategy, accelerated or standard renal replacement therapy was mandated. So uh, an opportunity to introduce some sort of selection uh, there. But overall, you know, I, I think it's, the evidence is there and I think it's robust enough to tell us that if you have a patient with, who's critically ill with, you know, severe AKI, um, you don't need to rush to start renal replacement therapy outside of the traditional indicators that we would use rather than just a time-based uh, uh, trigger to do so. And in fact, it may uh, increase the risk of harm by doing so. And so, you know, first do no harm. And, and I think we stick with what we've got. All right, Karen. So that brings us to the end of our whirlwind tour of the uh, uh, sort of five, our five favorite papers of 2020, 2021, the non-COVID edition. It was nice to take this walk down memory lane with you and a huge thanks to the Freilich brothers for allowing our voices to creep back onto the Rounds Table podcast. Um, and uh, thanks to all our colleagues in the uh, Division of General Internal Medicine across the University of Toronto for uh, listening to us opine. Yeah, and we'd love to hear your thoughts, questions, uh, agreements, disagreements. It's, let's open the floor up. And, and Brian's thankfully um, kindly offered to help us facilitate questions here. So turn it over to you, Brian. Fantastic. Now, do you want to leave your slide up with the uh, papers yeah, or do you want to uh, uh, just unshare your screen? What do you think? Um, I'll leave it up for now just so I can, if we need to quickly go back to a slide, just to remind people of the question or, or relative things, I'll leave it up. Sounds, sounds great. So just to maybe highlight a couple of things. One is just lots and lots of congratulatory comments around the format. Uh, the evidence synthesis, uh, just to, sort of the engagement. So I wanted to point that out. Lots of conversations. I'm going to have to pick and choose uh, wisely around uh, what to highlight. What else? Maybe I'll, I'll start with a question. And if people want to raise their hand and unmute their mic to ask questions, you can feel free to do that as well. Uh, but maybe I'll start off with one question, which is um, a lot of discussion about the mechanism of uh, for, for why SGLT inhibitor two inhibitors uh, improve outcomes the way we're seeing. And, and I guess one of the questions is, does it matter if we have large uh, randomized controlled trials that show uh, clear evidence of benefit? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, I, I tried to highlight that as one of those unanswered questions. Um, the New England uh, discussion in the article, as well as the editorial that accompanied it, and the follow-up um, uh, renal outcomes uh, letter that was published related to it, all are raising the same question. Um, I'm certainly not an expert in the neurohormonal effects of these uh, drugs. There are others around the city, like Mike Freilich, for example, who is. And so, if, Mike, if you want to chime in, you're please do. Um, but I think, you know, there are some thoughts that are these just simply the diuretic effects. It's possible, I suppose. Uh, but I, I think the short answer is, I certainly don't know. Uh, and it seems to me that nobody truly knows, but I, I would leave that to the experts to weigh in on. Yeah, and uh, just quickly, I'll say, um, I think that like, what's the mechanism by which statins reduce cardiovascular mortality or what's that like for clinical practice as humble clinicians, I think answering the mechanistic question is probably less relevant than having large randomized control trials and confirming that our patients match that population and all our usual uh, 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 things that we do around that um, rather than um, 
uh, sort of where is scientifically obviously very important for us to continue to try to understand what those mechanisms are and improve our understanding of physiology, which is horrendously incomplete. I see Haim has a, his hand raised. Would love to turn it over to him. Uh, thanks, and I, I'm I'm very conscious of being on the round, so I'm very thankful for for you calling on me and and fantastic work both Amol and uh, Kieran as well as the team. Uh, the, some of the chat that we are having and some of my skepticism, some of it relates to the mechanism, but some of it relates to, I'm just wondering why it happened so quickly, mm. right? That's that. And Joel Ray was talking about maybe hypokalemia, which is what was seen in some previous um, deaths that we're seeing, usually in people with um, left, uh, you know, impaired cardiac function who are on much, who are on high doses of, of furosemide and some of the, ch some of the challenges we would see when people were on digoxin, for example, uh, where, where you have that when we were looking at spironolactone for as, for, as an example, but I, it just, the, uh, the amazing thing for me is that these diverge. So the curves diverge so quickly that I, I'm not to say that the drug might be a miracle drug, but that's pretty quick to see an effect. And then the, the, and then the, the curves maintain that, yeah. that, you know, even though farther out you have, obviously the longer the follow-up, the, the more the um, uncertainty is around the estimate, but it seems like it, it starts quick and continues almost like a, like you would see in a surgical type trial, right? Where, right. You, where you'd randomize surgery to a medical thing and you'd, you'd have a very quick um, benefit early on that would be preserved. And, and to me, I, I'm just wondering, it's almost as if they've, the, the medication is replacing something that they're lacking that's causing something, right? Like it's, it's, it's a fairly quick effect. And I, I'm, I haven't seen people talk as much about that part of it. It's more that you know people get talk, talking about the the mechanistic effect, but but reality in for me the most compelling part is how quickly that happens and how it just stays apart. And and I don't know this time, and uh, but maybe you do or maybe others on the call do. Is was this seen with the HEFREF trials too? Like was the was the early divergence is that consistent with all of the SGLT two inhibitor trials? It'd be interesting to know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the other the other point I guess I am there is that if you know, although it was sort of a secondary analysis of the primary composite, if the, if this benefit is being driven by a reduction primarily in cardiovascular hospitalizations, you know, what is it that why doesn't that continue to separate over time? Like if it's these folks are often readmitted to hospital several times and they have a median survival of sort of two and a half years. Why do we not continue to see benefit? Um, so it raises a really good point. Uh, is it is it a surrogate for something else, or is it that you know they're preventing one earlier hospitalization because they're sort of in the trial and everyone's being paid attention to? I don't I don't know, but it's a great point. I'm just mindful of time. I want to maybe give Vera the chance to ask one more question before we wrap up. Vera, I don't know if you have a quick question. For, I was actually uh, going to make a comment, but looks like Mike Farrell already answered. I think it was an all with the SGL2 trials. And now, as you might know, uh, the um, CCS heart failure guidelines 2021 uh, SGL2 inhibitors are now first sort of up, up front with a beta blocker actually in trust on this perenolactone. That whole cocktail is uh, everyone needs to be started on uh, as initial therapy. Um, on a, on a separate, it's the same sort of with SGL2, but with DAPA, the renal protection trial that was just published uh, recently as well. Uh, so I wonder from the heart failure and renal, if there's some kind of interactions of maybe we're seeing the benefit. I don't know. Again, physiology is not my strength. Yeah, they, they <laughs> did comment. They, they, Vera, they, they, it's a great point. I mean, they're sort of trying to tease that apart in the, in the renal protection letter that was published. They were saying that the benefits the the renal protective benefits aren't seen to the same magnitude that was seen in the heart in the EMPA reduced, um, and probably the people who are benefiting in EMPA preserved are those with the mildly reduced ejection fraction, sort of on that spectrum of on their way to being fully reduced. Um, so 
their interpretation of it was that it's likely not driven so much by a renal protective effect in this population, but it still might be if you're teasing out that mildly reduced ejection fraction folks. Well, everyone, we're at the top of the hour. I want to thank uh, Kieran and Amol again for fantastic rounds. Uh, please, there's a link to this, um, the evaluation, if you could please uh, fill that out, um, provide uh, feedback on the rounds, the content, and the format. Uh, also, just remind people that these rounds are accredited, so you can um, uh, submit these for, I think, level one uh, credits. Um, lots of discussion in the chat, and again, these uh, these rounds were fantastic. Thank you very much, and really nice to see all of you. Uh, have a nice day.